So you're ready to learn more about computers. This is an introductory class that will go over essentially the equipment and the keyboard when using a computer. My name is Amanda Hill with the Workforce Centers of South Central Kansas. Now we'll go ahead and jump right in, going over the computer and hopefully helping you become a little bit more familiar with the tool um, that you will be using. The first thing is to kind of understand the pieces of the computer. And the most important piece of the computer is the tower, the computer tower, also known as the brain of the computer. This is where the memory is at. Um, it's what allows your computer to function. So without this, your computer really wouldn't be a computer. And so we'll go over the tower and what you'll find on the tower, all of those things um, so that you're familiar with it. This is where you will turn the computer on. You'll see a power button. Um, usually it kind of has that half circle with a line um, through it. And you've probably seen similar power buttons on other electronic devices. And so when that is turned on, usually there's a light to the side too, and, and that'll be lit up so that you know that it is on and not just kind of like in a standby or sleep mode. You will also find USB ports. And you're probably familiar with USB ports, mainly because of your phone if you have a cell phone. Um, and so just like you would charge in your cell phone using a USB cable, which will plug into the phone and then plug into the wall with that type of um, outlet there the computer has that as well. So that allows you to, you could charge your phone on the computer by plugging that cable in and then having your phone on the other end. But the main reason that you might have one of those USB ports on your computer is really for this flash drive that you see at the bottom. Sometimes it's called a thumb drive, but what it does is it saves your documents to that or pictures. Um, so your resume, pictures, Anything else that you may have uh, that you want to save and store, you can put on this little flash drive. And then it's portable, and you can plug it into any computer in their USB port and pull up your documents. The other thing that you might find on there is a CD or DVD drive. And so depending on how old the tower is, you know, I still believe most of them have this component. Now, um, again, if you're working with some type of laptop or otherwise, you know, some of the options may be different, but the DVD allows you, you could watch a movie on there. Um, in the past, a lot of programs were on CD. So that's how you install the program. And you can play music on there by putting in a, a CD. And so most of them will still have the CD drive um, capability. And so you may see that. So you might take a look at your tower at home and see what other things you see on your tower, um, just to kind of get more familiar with it. You'll probably see uh, a jack for like your headphones. Um, so that way you could listen to music or watch a movie without the noise going through. You might see a spot for a microphone. So just like teaching this class right now, I need some type of microphone plugged in um, in order to do that. You may see, um, trying to think about other things, and I don't even got a tower anymore because my computer is working off this laptop, so I don't have one to, to look at and reference now. But it um, may have some other spots. And so you'll just need to kind of further investigate that um, and to see what all those things do. But I think I covered most of it between the CD, the USB, and then the, the mic and the headphone jack should be basically everything. But definitely take a look at yours and, and explore. The next most important thing is going to be the monitor. 
Um, and so the monitor is really like a TV screen. That's how you're able to see what you've got on like your flash drive or that CD or DVD or whatever you put in there. Um, and so you put it in the tower or the brain of the computer, but then the actual picture is showing on the monitor. The monitor has the same type of power button. Um, and so each monitor is a little bit different, but usually it's in like the lower right hand corner somewhere. Um, I know on my screen that I have in front of me right now, it's kind of underneath on the bottom. Um, and so you'll want to take a look, but usually once it's turned on, it will light up as well as you see here. Um, and sometimes the monitors go into like a sleep mode. And so it may be like a black screen and you think the monitor's off, but really you just need to move the mouse to wake the screen back up. And so now we do get to the mouse. So yes, the mouse, it is not one of those critters that might be in your house somewhere, but it looks like this, or as this picture shows, it has a little scrolly bar in the middle. And now I need to get back to where I was. There, whoops, there we go. And then you also have where you can put your two fingers on it and then your thumbs kind of to the side. So when I'm sitting here at my desk, this would be how I would hold the mouse. And that placement is important um, just so that you're able to guide and maneuver it. One thing you'll notice about this picture is this one has a cord on the end of it where this one I'm able to pick up and move it really freely. So if you still have a corded mouse, sometimes they're a little bit difficult to maneuver just because it gets stuck on different things on your table or the cord's not quite long enough. And so sometimes you may have to make smaller strokes in order for it to work. Um, the nice thing about the cordless one is, is that you do have more flexibility with it. The bad thing is, is it does take batteries and then the batteries die. And then sometimes you're in the middle of something and you have to go switch those batteries out. So with the mouse, you have a, a right button, a left button and that scroll wheel I just showed you. And so more than likely you're going to be, um, if you left click, and you usually click twice um, to actually select or execute a function. The right click is going to bring up a shortcut menu. And so that's kind of for anything that might be considered a shortcut, like cut, copy, paste, um, and maybe some other options are listed there. Probably can show you in live mode in a, in a moment here. So. The left click, though, would be like actually selecting something. And then that scroll wheel, like I said, it, it can kind of also move up or down or take you through things as well. So as mentioned before, really to execute a function, you need to click twice. Most of the time, it's going to take two clicks versus the one click. And one thing that I notice people generally struggle with, especially in the classroom, is that when they click, they're kind of just clicking. And they're not pressing hard enough with enough, you know, not aggressively enough on the mouse. Not that you have to do it super aggressively, but it does take a little bit of click, click, you know, actually fully pressing down and give a little bit of power behind it um, to make sure that it, it knows that you are wanting to execute that function. When you get to your computer and the computer's powered on and everything, most of the time you're gonna land on what we would call your desktop. Um, and so your desktop, like a desk in real life, you know, you've got things on your desk like I've got here. And maybe you've got some files and maybe you've got different folders and, and things. And so this desktop allows you to have your program icons on the top of it. It allows you to have a trash can there. Um, it has um, where you can create different file folders and you know organize things. And so it's 
easily accessible to you from your desktop. You don't really got to go hunting and searching through your whole computer's memory bank there. Um, it's going to be right there visible for you to use. Um, and so that's what the desktop is. And it looks similar to this. So my desktop is usually always very messy because I have many files that I just, I tend to put everything on my desktop just so I know where it is at. But there are other places you can store things um, that are a little bit more hidden so that way it's not cluttering your desktop. The start menu is important um, because that's usually where you're gonna find your programs if they're not already on your desktop and anything else as far as, you know, programs or applications or whatnot that you may wanna use on your computer. And so I'll show that to you in the live mode towards the end of this as well, kind of let you see a real life view, but it's going to have that little Microsoft flag or it may say start. It's in the lower left-hand corner. And so just depending on the version that you have may determine what that looks like for you. So I mentioned icons a moment ago, and this is like another picture of a desktop with all of these different icons. So we've got Skype, we've got Dropbox and Firefox and Chrome and Spotify. And so between applications and programs and things like that, it is just a graphic picture that identifies what the program is that you'd be opening. The taskbar. So at the very bottom is generally where the taskbar is. And I say generally only because you can move the taskbar to other locations on the computer. So you don't see that often. You're probably going to find it on the lower bottom area of your computer. And this start button that we talked about is usually on that lower left hand side. And then you have some things that are called your quick launch icons. So things you use pretty frequently, like your email, the internet, et cetera. You can have some quick launch icons already there so you can immediately go there and, and bring that program up. Then you've got your taskbar. And so that is the empty space right now in our picture. But when you're working within a program, and let's say, you know, you decide that I need to take a break from this program. I got to work on something else now and you're kind of multitasking or you need to come back to that later. You can minimize it. And where it's going to go is it's going to go to the taskbar. So that way you can go back to your task that you were in the middle of. And so a lot of times people kind of are multitasking. That's just kind of natural. Um, and so you have, may have many things down there in the bottom in your taskbar, things that you're working on. And then you've got the notification area, which when you plug in your USB, it'll say, hey, you know, we noticed you put your USB in. Um, any other type of updates, security things might kind of pop up in that area. And then you've got your clock date and time. <clears throat> so a window. So Microsoft is kind of known for their windows. Um, and so when you pull up any type of program, that is a window. And with these windows, you'll know it's a window because, and I'm gonna move me over a little bit. They have where you can minimize the window, make the window bigger, or you can close the window by clicking on the X. So you may have many different windows open too. Um, so more than just a program, you might have different individual windows of programs that are open. And then you've got the keyboard. And the keyboard is typically where, when you're a beginner with the computer, that most people kind of struggle. And so mastering this, I think, is key in becoming, you know, familiar with the computer. And so a lot of the focus today will focus on the keyboard itself and what the keys do. 
So I also have a wireless keyboard, which takes batteries. Same thing happened. The other day I was in the middle of a class and my batteries died. So I had to stop and go put new batteries in. So you may have a wireless keyboard that doesn't have a cord attached to it. But if you're using a traditional computer um, that still does, then you know this would be plugged into the back of your tower as well as your mouse would be plugged into the back of your tower. And so these extra pieces, the tower plugs everything in again, it's, it's that brain. So um, with the keyboard, you know, some things to keep in mind are kind of what we have here on this graph is that you've got your typewriter keys. If you've ever used a typewriter before, that's gonna be pretty much the same. Then you've got your function keys at the top and that's all your F keys. And then you've got your cursor control keys, which are like up, down, side to side. And so that can help with navigation as well as if you're a gamer and using the computer, a lot of times those keys are needed. And then you've got your numeric keypad. And so that is going to be purely numbers and where that 10 key can come in in handy. So if you're typing in a lot of numbers, those would probably be the numbers you wanna use versus the numbers on our typewriter keys that are at the top of that typewriter section. So that kind of wraps up just general areas of the keyboard and getting familiar with those. Now, I wanna dive in a little bit more specifically on the keyboard. So let's take a look here. Let's talk about caps lock first. Caps lock, that is something that generally should not be pressed down, okay? And when it is, this little caps lock light. And if you look at your keyboard, you may not have that exact light right there, but somewhere on your computer, you probably have a light that shows caps lock. And it may, like on my keyboard here, it's a lock with a big A, that's what it says. It doesn't say caps lock. But if you press that caps lock button, look down at your computer and see what lights up, okay? So like I said, the caps lock really shouldn't be pressed in most cases. Even if you're just trying to get a capital letter, I'm gonna discourage you from clicking the caps lock button because then what happens is you forget to turn it off and everything's in caps. I don't know if you know, but when you type in all caps, that usually means that your tone is yelling or screaming and it can be taken as you being kind of rude. And so, you don't wanna type in all caps, all right? So you'll take the caps lock off. So if you've hit the caps button to see where your light is, go ahead and click it off again. So the only time you would really use caps lock is if you know for whatever reason you are wanting to type in all caps. But if you wanna just get one capital letter, you're gonna use the shift key. And the shift key you'll notice is here, but there's also one over here. So you have a shift on the right and the left-hand side. Why might you ask? Because depending on the letter that you're wanting to capitalize would determine which shift you use. If the letter you wanna capitalize is on the right-hand side of the screen, you're gonna use your left shift. If it's the opposite, you're gonna use the letter over here on the left and the right shift. And that will capitalize just the one letter. And so you press them simultaneously um, to get that caps, capital letter. And then you have your space bar, which puts a space in between words um, there. You also have your tab key and the tab key usually spaces over about five spaces. So that does the indentions for you. You have your backspace key. So if you hit backspace, 
that'll allow you to go back as many times as you press it and it'll erase the letters that you have there. Now, if you hold it down, it'll usually erase really, really quick. And then you have delete. And so delete and backspace is a little bit different. The backspace is gonna do the one by one and delete is more like if you highlight a whole paragraph or something, and then you decide you wanna delete that whole section, you can hit the delete key and it will delete that. You've also got punctuation keys within your keyboard. And so if the punctuation is on the bottom, you can just press the key and it does the punctuation. Like the question mark, for example, if it's at the top of the screen, then what you would need to do is you have to hit the shift key, kind of like a capital letter and press the button at the same time. So you'd have to hit shift question mark to actually get the question mark in this case. But the period is on the bottom, so you don't actually have to hit shift. You just hit the button with the period and it works just fine. To use these number keys on the number pad, you also need to make sure your num lock is selected or it won't work. And there's also a light for your num lock. So if you press the num lock button on your keyboard, take a look and find out which light lights up for you. Um, so if you're typing and you're using these keys over, over here and your num lock's not on, it's not typing anything in. And we especially run into this when you're typing in, let's say a password and you can't see what you're typing in anyway, because there's asterisks and stuff and your num lock's not on. And then it says you typed in the wrong password and you're like, no, I typed in the right password. I know I did, but your num lock wasn't on. So it didn't type any of the numbers. So that's gonna be key and making sure that the num lock is on if you're using those numbers on that side, because otherwise then it can, help you, you know, you might end up locking out your account, having to recreate your password and all of that good stuff just because the num lock wasn't on. Or you'll think your keyboard's broken or it needs batteries if it's a wireless one when really it is just the num lock key that needs pressed. Now, you can use the number keys on top of the regular typewriter keys at any point in time. They don't need um, to have that num lock key pressed. And so those will work all of the time. You'll notice above the numbers, there's also things like exclamation points, the at symbol, the pound symbol, the money symbol, et cetera. And anything on the top row, again, needs to have shift um, and then the number. So if I wanted an exclamation point, I'd have to hit shift one in order to get that to show up for us. Trying to see if I've, forgotten anything else really on the keyboard, you'll notice there is control and alt. And sometimes you do have to press those keys too. Um, control, alt, delete usually unlocks your computer. Um, if you lock it while you step away, you'll notice that there's an escape key in the top left-hand corner. Usually if you get stuck in something and you're not really sure how to get out or the thing's not working, you can try the escape key and it should take you out of wherever you're at. You'll see the little Windows flag, um, and that will usually pull up your window options as well. I don't really use that so much. And then the functions keys, the F keys, you know, they all have particular things that they do. And I don't know hardly any of them by heart, except for I do know F5 does refresh. So most of the time, if you're gonna press an F key, you're usually in some part of the computer where it tells you press F7 or press F8. I typically don't use those keys um, at all, like less than 1% of the time I would maybe use one of those keys unless I became more familiar, I guess, with them, maybe they become more useful. But if you don't know the F keys, you know, it, it's not gonna probably be that big of a deal um, because they're not really in use all of that often. I think that wraps up the keyboard for the most part. So this just, again, shows you where those lights are. You know, this keyboard picture looks a little different. So double check that. And then placement of your hands. 
to really get good at the keyboard and typing and things like that. And that's a lot of what I think people struggle with when on the computer is you have to know how to type to do anything, to surf the internet, to type an application in. So understanding how to type is going to be key. And I encourage you to practice and to get faster and better and more accurate. Ideally, you want to place your hands on the home row key, which is ASDF, JKL, semicolon. You'll notice on your home row key, you probably have, and mine are pretty worn out, but most of the time they have like some type of texture, little dots kind of raised up for their people to identify, you know, easily that they're at their home row key. And from there, you're supposed to just be able to reach up or down, up or down to get to the letters um, that you're needing by keeping your hands on home row. And so this gives you kind of a, an idea of what finger they think should go where when you are typing in information. So that wraps up just kind of going over some general basics. I'm going to pause this section and then I'm going to come back with kind of a live section showing you live some of these things that we just talked about.